Hey, everybody. What's up, guys? How are you doing today? You don't have to answer that question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, welcome to another episode of Eigen Bros. Indeed. So I'm Terrence. Yeah, I'm JJ. Um, so, yeah. So this week we actually talked about something, you know, do you remember the commenter's name? <laughs> it was Zaire Hala. Haludin or something. Well, we shout you out. In either the way, thing. we shouted you out in the video, and thank you for giving us this uh, week's topic. Actually, this yeah. was over some very interesting patents that came out uh, not too long ago. Uh, um, I think it might have been a while ago, like 2018, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And I saw, I saw that they were filed as far as 2016, but I think they okay. were approved 2018. Okay, there you go. So, so yeah, this is uh, some very interesting stuff that sort of aligns with our most recent ufo video which or ufo tech video which is maybe kind of a crossover between uh what's his name um the commander fravor commander one. Fravor, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so and i know you all love us talking about uh, <laughs> aliens <laughs> aliens and ufo tech you know that kind of stuff so we thought it was natural for for us to kind of speak on it a little bit yeah so, so um yeah you guys definitely want to want to make sure you'll check this one out here mm -hmm. i guess you're here but uh make sure to like subscribe comment share as usual mm -hmm. and then check out our twitter at eigenbros check out the website eigenbros.com yes and then if you guys like audio or if you're already listening to audio you can find us on spotify apple mm -hmm. google play all those platforms yeah. and yeah yeah stay tuned three <laughs> two one Welcome to another episode of the Eigen Bros. And wait for it. <laughs> the saga continues, ladies and gentlemen. So we're back with aliens oh, once again. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, we have a very interesting episode with aliens yes so um it was brought to our attention actually i gotta look up the guy real quick on youtube do you have uh Iger bros youtube up no um, i do not damn it now i gotta like scramble <laughs> <laughs> no but uh some listener out there i gotta shout out some, his name drop some very interesting info for us that we kind of changed plans and uh decided to do an ep on more uh sort of you know fan favorites i would say Th this is a fan favorite topic i think yeah like most of our fans love when we talk about alien stuff when we they get the perspective of us uh talking about alien tech since we're two kind of physics students and mm -hmm. you know physicists i guess and and like yeah we really appreciate you guys reaching out and, and giving us ideas like this so yeah, so keep them coming for sure, guys. Yeah. And the and the uh, gentleman who shouted us out or sh gave us this idea is Zaire Salahuddin. So I hope I said that right. Um, Zaire, we appreciate your work, man. He gave us a bunch of resources, too. Yeah, um, shout out. Yeah, very interesting stuff. So um, I guess we'll go ahead and start. So the topic today <clears throat> is on actually UFO technology. Um, it's, it's, it's the technology related to the... Um, I guess uh, to UFO like craft, I guess we could say. So um, yeah. So I don't know uh, if you haven't seen our previous podcast. We did one on Commander Fravor, and he underwent the. Um, he's the I guess the guy who reported the uh, USS Nimitz incident, which is where there was a Tic Tac UFO yeah. that was flying over um, some some uh, body of water. I forget exactly where. Um, and uh, yeah, he described some weird movements the UFO was doing, and you know, crazy speeds, yeah. Um, and then also like cloaking and whatnot. Yeah. So very extraterrestrial like um, technology um, for this particular craft. <clears throat> and uh, the interesting thing that Zaire sent us was these patents done by the Navy. Um, under a guy who's named uh, Salvatore um, Cesar Pais. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Sounds about right. Um, but he's this naval um, engineer, I guess, aeronautics engineer. He's got a PhD mm -hmm. in uh, engineering and aeronautics or something from NASA. Um, he did his dissertation on something related to bubbles. I forget what it's called. It, it should be in the resource there. Um, 
but yeah, apparently he received his PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering from Case Western Reserve University in 1999, and he currently works as an aerospace engineer for NAWCAD, N A W C A D at the at the Naval Air Station uh, Pat Patek Sint River in Maryland, mm-hmm. um, which is the Navy's top aircraft test base. Right. Yeah. And uh, he's published several articles and presented papers at, you know, the AI, well, the American Institute of Aeronautics and, Astro- um, and Astronautics Conference over the, couple, over the past couple of years. And uh, he's done work in electromagnetic propulsion, revolutionary sort of work in, I guess he's trying to work on room temperature superconductors. And yeah, stuff. These, are, these are now referencing the patents that he's had. So yeah. he's not really had any patents, I don't think, until these weird extraterrestrial type technology patents yeah and the reason i'm saying they're extraterrestrial i mean it's not really because it's based in physics that's real we'll get into that more yeah but um they're just very big leaps in technology like Mm -hmm. revolutionary leaps in technology yeah if you saw if you watch or listen to our last episode we kind of talked about that a little bit right yeah and um you should go ahead and and pull up that resource one again so on the on the notepad i have something at the bottom that this the the like four or five patents the names of them you can yeah, maybe read yeah. those in, in, in 2018 he he patented a high frequency gravitational wave generator and in 2018 a craft using inertial mass reduction uh and then in 2019 a piezoelectric induced room temperature superconductor where maybe we can probably get into that a little more that one sounds interesting plasma compression fusion device in 2019 so that's another one that he that he uh uh was able to patent in 2019 Mm -hmm. so yeah these all seem like the technology that might be necessary to achieve something especially the high frequency gravitational wave generator right yeah to to achieve some kind of ufo like propulsion system yes and the thing about all of those patents really are those would be all one of those alone will probably give you like the nobel prize in physics oh 100 percent. so to get all four of those yeah to get all four of those it would be an unheard of like beyond einstein beyond newton yeah (laughs) well this this generation uh yeah yeah it would be like yeah you would be a you would be game you would be revolutionizing the landscape of technology yeah. If, in fact, he invented those inventions. And our physical understanding. Yeah. So I guess let's go ahead and begin here, Juan, yeah. dissecting this. So really, with this, I thought it was very interesting. I kind of got deep into the whole patent process and everything. Mm-hmm. So, of course, on the face value, my eyebrow is raised through the fucking stratosphere. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. for the fact that one guy is supposed to invent... Uh, a, a room temperature superconductor, a mm-hmm. mini p- fusion plasma fusion reactor, yes. gravitational wave propulsion. Yes. I mean that just an inertial mass reduction. That is just on as just it doesn't seem realistic to me. It doesn't seem real. Uh, it kind of doesn't. It's kind of I'm kind of the skeptic in me is a little bit. Yeah, raised. I'm raised. Yeah. I have a raised eyebrow. I'm I'm looking at this. A yeah, little but, bit skeptical, yeah. Yeah, and the raised eyebrow is like through the fucking stratosphere. So yeah. it doesn't seem like one man could do all that. So yeah. all right off the bat, I can already say that I'm not feeling too good about this. But we'll continue on further. So um, just with that being said, um, I wanted to research a little bit on the whole patent process. Well, to, to kind of give credence, right? So this guy is legitimate. He's he's not like a Bob Lazar type. He He's... I, I can see some stuff here. His thesis was funded by NASA. Exactly. And he's a real person, um, or they're a real person, and they, they've they done a lot of research that's legitimate, you know? Right. Um, it looks like his background and everything is actually verifiable. Yes. Yeah, like exactly. Like Unlike B- Bob Lazar, he actually has credits, and you can trace back his PhD, his thesis, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So that's already a good sign there. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, so the interesting thing is I kind of wanted to delve into the patent process. So mm. I was trying to think, like, um, is there any kind of way that I could verify this just from analyzing or debunk this or not debunk this, comparing mm-hmm. it to the patent process? Mm -hmm. So the whole thing I researched with the patent process is basically um, 
let me think there should be a resource in there one mm. related to patents um I wanted to see if the rigor of patent, how what the rigor of patents were. So, like, let's say if I wanted to invent like a fucking perpetual motion machine, and I just made up some physics and said this is a perpetual motion machine, pat- could I get that patented? You, you, le- I mean, this is just from my own understanding of it. Yeah. yeah, you you can probably patent anything as long as it hasn't been patented before. I thought that too because I was like, maybe this guy's just patenting random shit. Yeah, that he can just make up something and then patent but it. there's a criterion like there's like a list of criteria that you have to meet for the u.s patent office there is now that yeah. brings me to the point of where you can check so i have something listed in that document related to the patent um uh criteria i forget what i called it do you see it on there uh no <laughs> okay so it should be like patent eligibility or something in parentheses well i can just tell you this there are certain criteria. You should be able to. F- you, you could look. I mean, hold on. It's because uh, I'm, I'm going to speak after? on. I don't know, but I'm going to speak on it. I'm going to speak on my experience. Here we go. So I knew a guy. I knew a guy when I used to work at retail. His his goal, he was working retail as a part-time job, but he was really looking to invent basically a new golfing, um, a new golfing what would you call that? A golf, a golf stick? What, what do you call that? <laughs> a golf club one. <laughs> you can tell I'm not. You can tell I'm not. I don't come from rich money. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> yeah, a golf club. He wanted to invent a golf club for these people because he's like, you know, you, you these people that had, they have expendable income. You, you you're going to spend money on fancy things like golf clubs. And he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm going to use like physics and stuff. And he, he wanted to pull me in because he was like, dude, you're a physicist. Can I get you to look at my patent? See if it's legit. Like, (laughs) you know, help me out here. Okay. Never, never really got a chance to help him out, but shout out to my boy. uh, I forget his name. (laughs) (laughs) It has been years, but I hope, I hope you made your, I hope you, I hope your uh, technology or your club, you know, went through the patent office and, and you were able to get that shmoney, man. You made, you made some, some very rich people happy, you know? Yeah, anyway. well, read that statement, though. I So I, I got the words prophetic highlighted there just to take you right to the section. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the wor- so this is from the USPTO.gov uh, website. Which is the official, like, patent um, office. Office, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it says working example. So... Um, an example may be quote unquote working or prophetic quote unquote. Uh, a working example is based on work actually performed. A prophetic example describes an embodiment of the invention based on predicted results rather than work actually conducted or results actually achieved. Um, an applicant need not have actually reduced the invention to practice prior to filing. So, so yeah, did you? Right. I think so, that's sufficient to. Right. Like yeah, that's a, just, that's hundred yeah, percent good. Yeah. So that kind of answered the question for me that if you can detail the invention in theory, mm-hmm. then you can put a patent on it, mm-hmm. which is kind of what I kind of is I suspected as well. Yeah. But I was thinking like, how stringent does a theory even need to be? You know, because if people are checking patents and there's a guy who makes a patent for this insane technology that let's say even physicists like me and you one can barely even understand, like. How is yeah. one guy supposed to filter through all this stuff? So yeah. I imagine that maybe there was some some way where they just had legitimacy, legitimacy checks with perhaps if you have publications that are legitimate mm-hmm. relating to your technology, then they can corroborate your story, I guess. Yes. But then I was kind of thinking that, okay, crackpots still put real publications in with their um, with their inventions. So how can you distinguish between them? So I found that there's really no good way it looks like. No. Um, But one of these patents in particular that Salvatore Cesar Pais um, got patented was of interest to me because it actually was denied by um, a guy named... um, I forget the guy's name. Benisoff, I think, is his mm-hmm. name. I hope mm-hmm. that's right. Um, you've got the thing there, one. I might have it on Benisoff. there. Benisoff. Maybe I don't. Um, but I th- there's a guy who denied his patent. And it was interesting because 
because he denied it, he gave a reason saying that the oh, and actually, let me get not get ahead of myself. The mm-hmm. patent that he denied was the one referencing the internal the inertial mass reduction. So he is uh, an inertial mass reduction generator or something. Um, and it was denied by one of these guys at the patent office and for reasons because he said that the, the electricity, the um, the E-field levels would reach like 10 to the 18th um, volts per meter or something, which is some crazy number. Um, yeah, that's insane. Yeah, yeah. And that's then, an insane electric field, electric field, right? Right, it's crazy. And then he also has another, uh, he also had the other reason saying that the magnetic field levels would exceed 10 to the 9 Tesla. So that's like, you know, 1 billion Tesla, which is also an absurd number. That's like the that's the number of what a magnetar would have, which is a celestial body related to like... Which is um, unachievable here. Like the highest magnets in field that we can obtain are like... 45 Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. There's like pulse field magnets that you can get up to like maybe 100. Oh, okay. But those are very short. Right, like very. We're talking about a couple, maybe even like less than a second. Right, right. We were able to achieve those fields, but yeah, this is unheard of. And still, that's ten to the seventh orders of magnitude. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, smaller than ten to the (laughs) ninth. (laughs) So that is an insane magnetic field. Um, So that already sounds like a good reason to deny the application. So I was like, Mm -hmm. okay, this is actually interesting because it was denied by a guy based on the physics. So it showed that he actually was checking the physics yeah. behind this patent. So this is the only patent I really studied in detail. So I want to yeah. kind of focus sure. our topic on this one. Mm-hmm. So it has to, be, to do with the inertial mass reduction. Right. Um, but yeah, the interesting part about this, though, was that the head, the CTO of this naval organization, I think it's the NALCAD, um, organization. I'm not entirely sure if if he's related to NALCAD or something, or uh-huh. if he's actually NALCAD. But the CTO actually wrote an appeal to the patent guy, and the patent guy eventually overturned the rejection because of the appeal from the CTO. So, for the people that don't understand, who's what's a CTO? So that's a chief technology officer. Uh, so he's the, for the guy. Navy. For the Navy. So he's the guy who is supposed to be the expert that you go through when you're. When, so there's an R&D department in this Navy facility. So yeah. NALCAD is for research and development for yeah, yeah, yeah. aero spacecraft and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for the Navy and the Marine Corps. Yeah. And the CTO is kind of one of the head guys that runs this organization uh-huh. and makes sure that your patents and everything are legitimate. Yeah. He doesn't actually go through them one by one, but if you appeal to him and he believes that your technology is legitimate, then he can send an appeal to the patent person yeah. checking your stuff. And have it overturned, which is exactly what he did. Mm-hmm. So he wrote a letter to the to the um, the the guy. I think Benisoff. I hope I'm not fucking up his name. Yeah. Um, he wrote a, a an appeal to that guy, and the patent guy Benisoff decided to overturn his rejection based on mm-hmm. that appeal. One of the uh, reasons he said was that China was already working on this yes. kind of technology. I'm re- I'm reading this here actually. Yeah. About go ahead. How uh, documents show this is from uh, this website called the drive this is actually one of the better resources on it oh really okay yeah. so so uh, <clears throat> this is an article by the drive.com uh, by Brett Tingley and Tyler Rogaway this was published in the summer of 2019 so June 28th apparently the docs show Navy got UFO quote unquote patent granted by warning of similar Chinese tech advances Mm-hmm. And patent documents indicate that the U.S. and China are actively developing radical new craft that seem eerily similar to UFOs reported by Navy pilots. Right. So, Navy, you know, something like what Commander Fravor reported, stuff like that. So, the U.S., I'm going to read a little bit here. There's um, actually the document on there, too. So, if you oh, want to read the actual text that um, the guy who was the CTO, his name was... Um, James Shahey, I believe. That's S-H-E-E-Y. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but James Shahey, the CTO, I think, of NALCAD, he responded with this uh, appeal. It should be on an image. Do you, do you see it there, Juan? Uh, it should be in a, a document of um, his appeal. So it says here, no, but I'm reading a lot of interesting things, actually. Okay. Um, 
I would just like to point out this. So in the case of Commander, well, just not Commander Fravor, but other people that have reported things. So he, there's an interesting correlation here because, uh, what's his name? Salvador, right? Salvatore. Salvatore. <laughs> <laughs> Salvador. Uh, Salvatore, uh, his thesis title is Bubble Generation in a Continuous Liquid Flow Under Reduced Gravity Conditions. Mm -hmm. And some of the patents are actually showing depictions of a hybrid aerospace underwater craft. So this is the one that I want to talk about. This is the yeah. inertial reduction um, yeah. craft. That's one. Of, this is one of the ones that I have pulled up. But, the, but this is from the same article that I yeah. was telling you about. They talk about this. They say uh, throughout the patents and publications describing a, a hy hybrid aerospace underwater craft, a H U H A U C, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and yeah, it's, it's it seems it seems it's it's kind of uh, insane a little bit. Yeah, if you try Just to read, read that patent, those. you're going to have your mind blown with the amount of physics, the high-level physics is required. Oh, yeah. I actually had to learn some QFT just to understand what the fuck this thing was talking about. Yeah. So this is not a very easy thing to digest. And I'm yeah. like, this patent guy, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I hope he had quantum field theory because, you know, as as... I don't. Uh, the audience doesn't know this, but I have not taken quantum field theory. Neither have you, Juan. But I'm taking a sort of quantum field theory class. Yeah. So you bit. might actually have some more interesting comments. But if you want to jump into maybe after the patent stuff, we can yeah. actually talk about some of the technology sure. behind this inertial mass reduction sure. um, vehicle. But uh, it was very high level. Um, at least for me, it was it was high level um, even for a physicist. But at least I had enough you quantum need, and relativity knowledge to be able to piece these things together. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you you need to. I mean, at this level, I mean, the stuff that you need to, I think, understand a lot of this technology, especially the high temperature superconductivity stuff. Mm -hmm. You need to have a good grasp of like quantum field theory in condensed matter, which is its own sort of beast. Um, Do you need quantum field theory for um super te uh, high temp superconductors? Because I yeah, thought those man, were just need, to do with BCS theory. You need you need this shit, man. You need this stuff right here, baby. Do you <laughs> see you this? Go. That's, Quantum uh, theory of many, par many particle systems right here. You need this. That's Federal and Waleka. There you go. If, if anybody has solutions to this, let me know. <laughs> 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 I need to check my work. That's really... Juan's <laughs> <laughs> proposition. Uh, yeah, yeah, solutions. just like... Please, I need help. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> By the no. time this podcast comes out, I think it's going to be too late. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, but it's, uh, yeah, this is, uh, you, you need this high level of physics to kind of understand the newer breakthroughs that we've had in the past 30, 40 years. Yeah. Um, like, like the superconductivity stuff. Yeah, like BCS, yeah, but it's built on on the foundation of like ma understanding many particle systems and stuff. Okay. And the quantum mechanics of that. Okay. I guess cause it's relativistic particles, yeah, right? You can simplify okay. it. You can, okay. you can definitely simplify it. Like, I mean, there are books that give you kind of like a condensed version of BCS theory and just, you're like, oh, okay, cool. And you, you, okay. you can probably get by knowing the quantum that you've taken. Cool. So. But yeah, just to preface for everybody, um, since this stuff is requiring quantum field theory and related concepts with uh, relativistic particles, we are not experts on this, and I have not taken a single class on quantum field theory, so just keep that in mind, <laughs> but we'll do as best as we can to try to describe some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I just, so going through this article, it, it seems a little bit interesting. I'm not finding anything about um, the patent stuff, but they do talk about the HUAC with components. Um, yeah, want, so maybe we can just get off, get off the drive page okay. and let's go to the actual patent of the inertial mass uh, reduction craft. Okay. It so, should be in that so craft list. You, yeah, so the abstract. Yeah, you I'm can go to read here. that abstract. So read it slowly, though. It says, craft, you can Google this yourself. Uh, just Google uh, Salvatore Pais and then uh you can add craft using an inertial mass reduction device. And the abstract says a craft using an inertial mass reduction device comprises of an inner resonant cavity wall an outer resonant cavity and microwave emitters, the electrically charged outer resonant cavity wall and the electrically insulated inner resonant cavity wall form a resonant cavity. And the microwave em emitters create a high frequency basically high frequency um, 
electromagnetic waves throughout the resonant cavity, causing resonant cavity to vibrate in an accelerated mode and create a local polarized vacuum outside the outer resonant cavity wall. So is that it? That's pretty that's pretty much the okay. end of the thing, but um it just seems so that doesn't really tell you anything about no, it, it doesn't. what it does, it right? It doesn't, but um, the kind of getting into some of the components here, uh, if you see images of the craft... I'll put so, them on the um, so yeah, YouTube they, video. It's a little bit... It's kind of like a diamond. It's kind of like diamond tip, and one, of, one, one figure shows like a triangular kind of depiction. If you go down to the actual um, spec where it starts to say numbers like 155 and right, bold... Right. That will actually tell you what the description of the aircraft is a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. It says here images of the craft uh, and the components. So, yeah, you see you see the resonant cavity filled with noble gas like xenon or mm -hmm. it could be probably anything, any other noble gas. Uh, there's a crew compartment, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Mm -hmm. A Faraday-type cage to protect crew against electromagnetic fields. Yep. And a cargo bay a power plant system and a frustrum or nose cone which is right quote unquote rot rotatable about its own axis right meaning that it can probably it can probably go from like a diamond like this mm -hmm. laid out and then just go on its axis exactly right? exactly so this yeah. aircraft actually is like a the picture that you're seeing if you are looking at this on the I'll put on the on the um, YouTube page too hopefully yeah. enough to look at it some but um you're seeing like a side view of the aircraft yeah. So the di there's one part of the diamond that goes forward, and then there's one part of the diamond that's the end tail. And then there's a crew compartment, and then there's the um, the uh, the power systems in the back. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, and then the then the I guess the the solid exterior of that diamond with the kind of the detailed stuff inside of it is the actual resonant cavity. Mm -hmm. And there's the outer resonant cavity, which has the electrical charge on it. And then the inner cavity has a dielectric material. Mm -hmm. And the dielectric is just something that's non-conductive. Mm -hmm. So the outer part of that resonant cavity is supposed to vibrate from the microwave frequencies that are shot into that cavity. And then once those microwave frequencies are matched up to the resonant frequency of that um, cavity... That is supposed to induce a vacuum polarization. So this vacuum polarization is where you start to get into the QFT stuff. So I had no idea what the fuck a vacuum polarization even meant until I started diving into the whole zero point field. And you know, we talked about before how cranks love zero usually, point shit. Yeah, that's usually where the cranks start coming <laughs> That's where in. you get the EM drive and all that crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. almost sounded like EM drive to me. I was like, okay, this guy literally just patented the EM drive, <laughs> but he actually didn't. He, got, he, he patented something that utilizes some physics that are theoretically like have some theoretical justification yeah um but basically polarizing the vacuum means that there's I have a to give a there's... kind of a qft lesson but yeah from, do you do you know i mean from my understanding right yeah. the vacuum is there are you can sort of understand it the vacuum isn't empty it isn't empty yeah right. it's not empty there 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 stuff there's stuff there there's particles there and the way you, yeah, I know. <laughs> for the for the, let's just leave it for the layman. Okay, we the, don't want to get too confusing. No, though. no, no. But let's just say this makes it easier to understand polarization. But polarization, the act of polarization is, you take, you take something and you create, basically poles. So now you have like like positive and negative, right? So when you polarize okay. something, right? I mean. I have Terrence You're talking here about regular, regular electric polarization. Regular, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right? To make it easier to understand the, okay. the vacuum polarization process. But yeah, the the polarization process is just is such that you you necessarily create a differential, like almost like it's like you have particles on a uh, on with one polarization on one side and then particles with another polarization on another side. Let's think of it more simply. So just okay. think of this: if you have an atom. So you know an atom has a nucleus that's positive. Oh, H2O is probably the most... Well, let's just think of a hydrogen atom. Okay. And a hydrogen atom has a positive nucleus, so it's full of protons and neutrons. The neutrons don't matter because they have no charge. Then that proton is surrounded by electrons. You can think of them as, in this case, as a little billiard ball you see in texts. That's not really the accurate picture, but it works for this scenario. So then 
if you actually put, let's say if you put another proton that has no electron next to the, the proton with an electron surrounding it, you will create a polarization because the electron in that nuclei, in that energy shell will be attracted to the positive proton that sits next to it. So then you have a, uh, your electron gets attracted to that proton and then your proton that's in the nucleus just stays where it is. So then you have a dipole moment is what they call it. And that's yeah. polarized. So, yeah, you can think about this as an like in nature, right? In equilibrium, meaning, yeah, in equilibrium, those those two charges balance out each other. Yeah. But in disequilibrium or in polarization or some mm-hmm. kind of effect like that where, you know, one of the charges shift, you know, there's more of a concentration of a charge on one side. Mm-hmm. It, it creates a polarization. There effect. you go. There yeah. you go. So there's a net charge right so right. say and so, usually in most things in nature there's a neutral or no net yeah, charge yeah so that's that's why you're not like zapping your computer every second or yeah. you know when you touch electronics it's not frying it because you're, you're not, net neutral polarization yeah, or net neutral charge yeah you're not magnetically attached to any metal stuff or something right <laughs> now the interesting thing about vacuum polarization is apparently in quantum field theory all of space-time is permeated by fields. So that includes an electromagnetic field. Mm-hmm. Um, and interestingly enough, this is where it gets kind of weird. Um, I guess I can kind of go through the history. So this is with Dirac. Dirac actually invented the Dirac equation as a as a um, evolution to the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation is the classic quantum mechanical equation that's used to describe the energy and the wave function of a massive particle that is Mm non-relativistic. Now, I need to unpack that. (laughs) So non-relativistic means it does not travel at near light speeds, and um, massive means that it's not like a photon that's massless. Mm -hmm. So the Dirac equation now is an evolution to this because it includes relativistic speeds now. Yes. So you can have massive particles that are relativistic, and... Dirac made this, yeah, he made this because the Schrodinger equation does not have solutions for a relativistic particle. It's not particle. relativistic, yeah. Right. Now, essentially, when he did this, he figured out all the mathematics that went along with this, but he noticed that when his solutions came out, there were negative energy solutions. So, this is weird because then it's saying that now electrons, he used the electron as an example, so relativistic electrons, this means that you can have electrons that have negative energy. Mm-hmm. Now, what the hell does negative energy mean? That doesn't mean anything to us. We don't have any concept of what that means. Maybe now we do, but at the time when Dirac was doing this, he didn't know what that meant. So that means that when we have our electrons, we like to say that they're in positive energy shells. So yeah. it is, it's, it's in a positive energy state or, or nothing. It's not yeah. going to be in a negative energy state. So that means that he said that, okay, we knew about the Pauli exclusion principle, which means that no two atoms can occupy the same space or no two particles can occupy the same space. Yeah. So he knew that that means that all of space needed to have these negative energy shells filled. So he said that that means that all of these energy shells need to be filled by negative electrons or by electrons with negative energy. So he's saying that all the energy states in the universe were filled by electrons with negative energy which made it so that the electrons will now only want to go in positive energy states. Yeah. And so this this fixed the problem. But of course if you can already if you're, you know, a physicist or someone who's, you know, who understands this stuff, you can already see a problem with that means that the whole universe needs to be filled with electrons. That means that's a negative charge. But there's some other things that fix <laughs> that. Um they're they're saying that the base vacuum is positive, but don't worry about that. Yeah. So then with this Dirac C is what he calls it, a C of an electrons in the universe. Yes. This, uh, yeah, I have some notes on that, actually. The Dirac C, um, he's saying that when there's an excitation in this vacuum, so let's imagine that the vacuum is fluctuating and whatnot. Let's say if you have an excitation, like a photon somehow excites the vacuum, it'll pop up one of these negative energy electrons, and that, le- that leaves behind an anti-electron or a positron, mm-hmm. a positive charge. Mm-hmm. So then that's actually how he came up with the concept of a, of a positron. And this positive charge that's left behind shows you that there's also these positive holes, you can call them, holes, in the yeah. vacuum. So when you're polarizing the vacuum, you're actually polarizing these anti 
protons and these I'm saying these anti electrons and these electrons these positrons and these electrons yeah. and that's actually what is polarizing the vacuum and the thing is they actually verify this experimentally so this means that this is actually a real thing com- yeah according to the physics that there is um, although the Dirac C interpretation is not really taken seriously as much anymore and it's been it's been cleaned up to actually be a, a quantum field theory yeah 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 but the mathematics is equivalent. So yeah. that is kind of what it means to polarize the vacuum. It's a very high level concept. And if you don't understand what that means, don't worry. You're not <laughs> dumb. This is like, <laughs> this is some hard this is, shit to this analyze is, this is at your this third, level. Third level not, of gradu- new. This is third level graduate yeah. school stuff. Even for me, um, I was look, reading this like, really? <laughs> but then uh, it actually does make sense if you look at the math. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of interesting. Like, yeah, you, you do see... Like the idea of holes is something that permeates, uh, at least can well, the condensed matter quantum field theory aspect of it is non-relativistic. So we we do use ideas like um, you know electron holes mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So so yeah, but those is, are different because this is actually like positrons in this yeah, case. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the, nonetheless, some of the ideas exist. Yeah. That that were were, were presented by Dirac and and. Uh, and yeah, so th- this is so. What we're trying to say here is that so these ideas are not completely bunk, right? The, they're is, realistic. They're grounded like, in in real physics. Yeah, this this inertial mass reduction paper had all real physics concepts in it. They were just all like these kind of so close to the bleeding edge of tech, which makes sense if you're going to have a new technology, yeah. right? But it's hard to verify because some people agree that it's real, some people agree it's not real. Yeah. Um, and I really, and I actually, at the end of the whole thing, I really didn't understand how he was going to reduce inertia with this. So I understand the whole vacuum polarization thing. There was also some some physics related to um, the quantum vacuum plasma. So I read about quantum quantum plasma thrusters in this, and it, I wasn't sure if that had anything to do with it. I don't think it did, um, but he was supposed. But I guess maybe it did. I think it did. But I didn't really understand at the end of it why that was going to reduce inertia. And I was hoping that maybe we could just, maybe kind even if you had an idea speculate. about it, Juan. Yeah, because the thing is with inertia, what's the inertia mean? It means the the the, um, the resistance for your... Change. Part, yeah, for your particle to want to change um, change its state. Um, yeah. Not change its state. Um yeah, to change its motion, motion, motion yeah, specifically. Yeah. So yeah, if it's yeah. moving in a straight line, it wants to stay in a straight line. If it's at rest, it wants to stay at rest. Yes. So your uh, your inertial mass is basically just the mass. It's equivalent to just saying mass. Yeah. So I'm thinking that maybe it's just this abstract concept where you're just using you're just treating mass mass like it's a coefficient, just like you would treat like um, the spring constant or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mass is is just the ability for the object to resist motion in some way. No, kitty, get off. <laughs> she got you with those claws? Yeah. I'm but, wearing shorts. But yeah, so then I was like, okay, so that means for me what that would mean is I already talked about this in the last podcast mm. before um, with alien UFOs. But my thing was you need to reduce the inertia for the people inside the cargo. Yeah. Like we don't really care so much about reducing inertia for the actual aircraft because then you could go to supersonic speeds, but the people need to be able to stay alive in the craft. So if you could, let's say if you were going at some hypersonic speed inside the aircraft, you would need some kind of opposing gravitational field to where they canceled out or some kind of opposing well, whenever acceleration. You accelerate. Yeah, whenever, yeah. Whenever you're decelerating or accelerating. Exactly. You need like, to have some cancel. You need to have some exactly opposite. Yeah. Uh, field that cancels that out. And then yeah. you would just feel like you're in free. You would just feel like you're in free fall all the time or. Yeah. Or have some lower normal gravity or something. Yeah. When, so so the idea here is that what, what argument we're trying to make is that. OK, when you're moving in, in a car, right? Yeah. When, you, when you're accelerating, you. You feel you feel the you feel the jump, like you know yeah. they, they built they built they built those uh, they built the seats so that you know you when you when the car accelerates you can at least recline back. But if you're talking about an <laughs> aircraft that can accelerate to like s- Mach craft, like five and shit, y- something insane, right? You, you or accelerate to accelerate oh, to like eight G's. 
Yeah. Yeah. Eight times the speed of gravity. Yeah. Unless you have a mechanical heart, like there's no way. <laughs> so you're going to, you're going to yeah. you know, pass out for two seconds. <gasps> yeah. Like just like, you know. <laughs> yeah. If you've seen insane. those G force videos, I actually yeah. had a clip of it in the last podcast yeah. that we did. <laughs> yeah. Those people you pass out cause literally your blood cannot pump to your brain yeah. and now you have no oxygen in your brain. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's uh anyway that, that you, you need something to counteract the level of force that's generated by the acceleration otherwise this is going to make it un unfeasible for you to really be a manned operation yeah you can't yeah. go at hypersonic speeds at that level yeah if you're experiencing those kind of g-forces yeah. so this is what the inertial mass reduction device is trying to do i imagine you think so okay yeah i think it is and also so it's like creating some kind of vacuum or something around the aircraft but i don't really understand it when I was trying to build the picture up in my mind, I couldn't really get it fully. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand entirely what its goal is to do. Like if it, if it's if it's reducing the amount of sort of mass, the the, the inertial mass, I guess. Yeah. Then, man, they're saying it has to do with negative energy somehow. Man, that's so, nuts. Yeah, so with negative energy. That might make sense because then you could have a negative kinetic energy and then if you have a negative kinetic energy, the only way it could be negative is because you have negative mass. But I don't understand how that has what that has to do with the vacuum and I suspect that maybe it has something to do with this the Dirac C because of those yeah. negative electron energy states. But I did not understand it. I mean, I went through a ton of research with this yeah. and I couldn't build a really convincing image in my mind of how this could work. But apparently... Well, this is the first time I've hear, I'm hearing of this, so this is yeah. very interesting to me. The, either way... Some of the scientists, though, just to clarify, some of the scientists who did analyze this, who were, you know, um, professors and whatnot, um, better, more experienced than us, they were saying that this is kind of like, doesn't make sense, or doesn't follow anything that they're familiar with. Yeah, like that, um, like the guy, the patent examiner, Philip Bonzel. Right, right. Yeah. Bonzel, there it is. Yeah, Thank he you. Says I said Benazov. <laughs> I'm glad you corrected it. No, he says there's no such thing as a repulsive EM energy field. Right. And they're um, saying that the thing is, uh, the CTO who wrote back to, Benaz to Bonzel said that they were already a year in testing these concepts. They were a year in and mm -hmm. test these concepts. And I mean, um, here's a thing that maybe to get off the physics a little bit. Some of the references were to a guy named um, Hoff something. Or Can you look in the resources? Yeah. One, it's like Hoff something is his name. Um, I think his last name's Hoff something. Oh, Dr. Harold E. Puthoff. Puthoff, yeah. He... Okay, there's a thing that you guys should also know about physicists is sometimes they're not always reliable. <laughs> physicists can go crazy. They do do crazy experiments and I mean, have some crazy concepts sometimes. What's his name? The guy, the, the, the bomber guy, what's his name? The Unabomber? The Unabomber guy? I don't know his name. Well, he was... Oh, Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh. Yeah. He was... Yeah. Uh, I, I know a guy who knew a guy that taught... That taught well while he was an undergrad or something like that. Really? Yeah. Damn. Was he talking about bombs all the time? I don't know, but uh, <laughs> that's kind of nuts. But yeah, these people are not infallible. Yeah, they know a lot of things. I've, uh, but oh, uh, not the classic. Another example for me was Josephson. So if you remember Josephson, the guy who invented Josephson Junction. Yeah. Physicists will know this guy. He's a huge deal in the physics community. Um, he had to do with the whole Josephson Junction and the whole BCS theory with superconductivity back in the days. But this guy is like doing research in like para parapsychology, which is like oh, telekinesis no. kind of stuff. Yeah, um, he does other kinds of crazy shit. The Putthoff guy that I was specifically referencing though was actually mentioned by Salvatore in his patents. Okay, but Putthoff is a guy who used to, who was involved with Scientology. Oh, so God. he is one of the highest level Thetan levels of Scientology. Which is like at the time it was like OT seven or something, which is stands for operating feet and levels. Um, so yeah, it says here Puthoff is an electrical engineer. Yeah, he's an inventor who published research on polarized vacuums. So a lot mm -hmm. of his work came on polar. You know, work, he worked on right. polarized vacuums, but he's also associated with paranormal and topics like remote viewing. So yeah, I forget even what that is, but I know it's a crazy viewing, one. Remote viewing. Actually, remote view is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a sort of psychedelic kind of thing. Can we go mm. into that? I want to. I want to. Sure, I wanna, we can touch on it a little bit. It. Yeah. dude, this is 
this kind of let's nuts. not get too off I'm track. Not, though. I'm okay. not, but maybe we can talk about this in some other episode. Yeah. But uh, interestingly enough, the CIA released some very interesting papers that they when they were working on this sort of, you know, when psychedelics were coming into the seventies and stuff. Mm-hmm. The CIA were was very interested in developing sort of agents or spies that could somehow see if they, if they could get people to to sort of hallucinate to the point where they had out of body experiences and in those out of body experiences see if they could actually sort of go somewhere else Oh, I so, see. So if they could go to a location and... So it's like a spirit journey in like Chicote and Star Trek Voyager. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And, and no, but but they tried to sort of weaponize this in a way. So they took the psych- psychedelic experience and tried to say, okay, you hippie guy, can you tell us what's going on in this location in Russia at this warehouse? Okay. And that so sounds they, like Stranger Things. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. Well then, dang. With, um, well, the girl Eleven, she can like transport herself to oh, Russia. This, this and, is remote well, viewing. Okay. So, so yeah, this is kind of like what the CIA was really interested in. They were they they had a psychedelic, not a psychedelic, but but basically, they were trying to see if this had any validity and and uh, so this was like legitimate research that they were doing for some time. But I'm sure the tests came up inconclusive. There were reports that some of them, only a few of them, were not. That they were anomalies, like they they were there were like one or two people that could actually predict, according according to the papers. Right, but yeah. that's one of these classic things that happen with an experimental error. Like sometimes yeah, you're yeah, gonna yeah. get the result that you want, yeah. But then if nobody can verify it, that's when it's yeah. bunk. No, very very this true. It's the same thing with the EM drive. Yeah, like the EM drive, people got results. Even NASA got the result yeah. of the EM drive, but then no one else could replicate it. Yeah. So this. I mean, I'm not going to dog the guy for it. Maybe he was going where the money was, man. You know, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. Like if maybe unless he's still doing remote view and he's like, there's something to this guys like then that we well, need- he, he's known for this and he's also part of Scientology. So I doubt oh, he's doing it for the money. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, so flush, flush sound effect. Yeah. If I have one, that's going to you know yeah. go down the drain. But yeah. Um, anyway, this, this guy, Harold E. Puthoff. He's a little bit of a questionable source. Right. Of course, that doesn't mean their physics is bad. And, you know, a lot of guys who are like that, you know, super religious or, you know, really yeah. into like crazy theories or whatnot, they I can mean, be very intelligent oh, yeah. and they can do things a lot logically. But then you also have to be wary that some of their pathways are kind of questionable. Yeah. We, so they, they can't really differentiate between a, a good pathway or not sometimes. For, for the record, there's a lot you only hear about the good ideas. You don't hear about the junk ideas like Dirac probably had like a lot of kooky ideas from what I've heard. Sure. Like he, you know, he But he didn't pursue them if they didn't yield anything useful. You no, know, yeah, yeah, but he had this I mean, there's a lot of guys that think like, you know, um well at his time he was like, you know, beautiful mathematics. If the math if the math isn't beautiful then yeah. it's not worth investigating, but sometimes math is ugly, you know. Anyway, I kind of know what he means, though. Yeah. It should be simple to understand. If it's not simple to understand, it means you don't understand it. We can get into this some more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, basically, yeah. To me, that's kind of like, nah, man, this is reality. You know, you, at the end of the day, reality has its say. Like, if it doesn't right, but fit reality, reality. is as simple as it needs to be. Yes. Doesn't mean it's not complicated, but you should be able to sum it up in a way that makes sense because things are patterned. And yeah. if you understand the pattern, you should be able to convey it in yeah, a meaningful way. Yeah, but it doesn't, doesn't need to be elegant is what I'm trying to say. I think it does, though. I think it needs a certain elegance to it. Then, Everything then, that we've ever studied has a certain elegance to yeah, it. Yeah, but you're ascribing your own human aesthetic. I don't think so. You I don't, don't think, think so. so. No. All right. I, we, think we, that has to, I think that's a... I think I get why they say that now. I, th- yeah. I used to think that back in the days, yeah. but I understand why Einstein and Dirac and all of them say that because there is a a beauty to mathematics. To me, that's like sacred geometry stuff, man. I don't think so, man. I don't think so at all. All right, all right. I think it, I think it really makes sense. We, we can debate on this at some point. Yeah. But, but I think to, nasty mathematics is a sign that you don't know what you're doing. Or okay. you're doing something in a convoluted way that you have yet to yield the actual beauty of what it actually means. It's a hot take right there, man. Me, sure. We'll, we'll, we'll get, no, I'm just kidding. We'll get back to that. I think uh, it, it can be, because I didn't agree with it in the past either. No, we can, actually, yeah. we might. We, maybe this is a good discussion topic for some... Another like, time? For another sure. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, this is a very interesting one, and I want to. Yeah. yeah, I know we we have we have we're living on borrowed time, but yeah, um, yeah it's uh, yeah this this is a wildly insane. Yeah, I mean, he goes in the come across, he, man. he goes in the concepts like pointing vector and all this, and he says that. So one of the components of this thing is he's saying that you need to generate a high frequency um, magnetic field with a rotating um, something rotating axially around um, an object and then also a high frequency f field rotating just transversely. And that's going to be the way to generate the vacuum polarization. That's another thing that didn't make any sense to me, really. I don't know how that's going to generate a vacuum polarization. Yeah, A lot of this thing is either very high level or it's just like complete junk. I'm going to go with I just don't know because it is venturing into quantum field theory territory, which is not something I know enough about. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'd give a better answer if I knew it better. Yeah. Um, but literally, when I was research researching this thing, I was learning about quantum field theory as I was doing this. Hmm. So Yeah, I mean, it says here, you highlighted something where it said, it is possible to reduce the inertial mass and hence the gravitational mass of a system or object in motion by an abrupt perturbation. Yeah, so that is... Um, you can go to the actual patent. Mm -hmm. That's a paragraph in the patent. That to me was the key, one of the keys to understanding what the hell this is. But you can read it. Um, I don't understand what it means, though. I, I tried reading it many times, and it, it just didn't click for me. Um, maybe if you read it, you might have some kind of thoughts on it. But, um, yeah, go ahead and, uh, I guess, read that paragraph. It's kind of nuts. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, there's a lot of jargon. This is the one that kind of is the key, though, I believe. Yeah, it seems... Uh, okay. So read it slowly, though. <laughs> it's very, it's very, very okay. dense. One sec. Oh, you're, you're researching? You're looking it up now? It is possible to reduce the inertial mass and hence the gravitational mass of a system or object in motion by an abrupt perturbation of a non- of the nonlinear background of local space time. Slower one. So, yeah, so you're able to reduce the inertial mass and thus the gravitational mass of a system mm -hmm. slash object in motion by an abrupt perturbation of the nonlinear background of local space time. Right. So, the nonlinear background, I didn't know what that meant. So, what I, is nonlinear about it is my question. So I think what they're talking about in local space time, I think that just means in a local region. So your local, object's in a localized region. Yeah. But then what is the nonlinear background mean? I think I think they're talking about the force, or the maybe I would imagine they're talking a about a nonlinear the force. force? Yeah, well, because gravity is is one of our R, right? The, well, oh, the, potential. the gravitational force. Well, it's you, not. It's not necessarily linear. I okay. think that's what I think they're just probably inter putting in jargon a little bit. <sighs> okay, I'm not convinced of that, but continue. It's not linear, so okay. uh, yeah, so um, cuz it falls off as you get okay. sufficiently far away. But we're um, also in a localized region, so you could approximate that, I would imagine. Yeah, I think they're saying but I think that's what they're saying. You you can you can reduce okay, so they're saying that you can reduce the inertial mass and the gravitational mass of a object in motion by basically changing the by changing the not hmm, by changing they're saying by modifying the background of the of local space time yeah so modifying in this case i assume has to do with the resonant cavity and the micro yeah um the micro resonant frequency yeah. you're sending on the cavity because the cavity vibrates yeah and that's what is controlling this ship essentially or doing things the that's what's doing the new physics here the resonant cavity yeah they're saying the local space time they're referring to as the local vacuum energy state yeah um continuing on yeah yeah it says equivalent to an accelerated excursion far from thermodynamic equilibrium um Whatever that means. Yeah, exactly. That's just, that's just that's just jargon to me. Yeah. Analogous with symmetry breaking induced by abrupt changes of state. Okay, all right. That, fine. I didn't understand that one either. Um. How can I say it? Symmetry breaking. You just your sim your system doesn't look the same. And like yeah, but what does it mean in this context? I don't understand because he's making it sounds like he's making an analogy. 
So he's saying that it's analogous yeah. or it's 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 yeah, it's analogous to breaking symmetries with a phase transition somehow. Yeah. I don't know what he's saying though. He's he's compared it to yeah, two but things, what I think. Phase transitions my thing is like I mean There's I, so I many assume, phase transitions, th- right? Yeah, I mean I would assume these I would assume they're being vague on purpose. That would be a way to mask what you're Real. that you don't know what you're talking about. Well, that but also I know that you you don't necessarily want people to replicate your patent. I guess, but the thing is, if it's the Navy who did this, this is another thing. So I also researched the, there's a thing called the Invention Secrecy Act yeah. that the government passed in 1951, where they can render pretty much any patent that they see fit secret if they'd like. And they've done this to like 144 patents this year or something, or maybe last year. Yeah. So they do actively do this still. And they can basically make it so that no one can see this patent except for the government. Mm -hmm. So if they really wanted to make these patents secret, they could have easily done that. But they chose to make it public for some reason. Mm -hmm. So this is very uh, this is a very confusing um, scenario to me. I just don't understand what what is happening here. Yeah, I'm I'm fast forwarding a little bit because a lot of this is kind of jargon. Well, that um, whole paragraph is is pretty much it. If you just read uh, that okay. one paragraph. So, so it says the physical mechanism which drives the diminution in inertial mass is based on negative pressure exhibited by the polarized local vacuum energy state. So uh, right. exhibited by the uh, local space time. Um, yeah, so that's one of the key parts there. So that negative pressure, of course, we know f- pressure is equal to force per area. So I assume that the changing variable in there is the force, the force right? Because yeah. the area is just going to be whatever the cross-sectional area is, right? Yeah. But then the force is going to be dependent on the acceleration mm-hmm. or or on the mass. mass I'm sorry, on the mass. Yeah. So I think it's got to do They're with that negative. Yeah, I think it's got to do with that negative energy from the mass or whatever, from that positron or positron. Yeah, I mean, if something in that vacuum field. That's what I don't if understand. If you're reducing your mass, well... No, because then you would be okay. All right, all right. we we can take, we can think about this yeah. more more some more time. Okay, so uh, so moving on. So it says uh, local vacuum polarization being achieved by a coupling of accelerated high frequency vibration with accelerated high frequency axial rotation of an electrically charged system or object. So. so so yeah, so uh, let me reread that again. Yeah, 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 do that, do that. <laughs> Jesus, this is this is what reading physics papers is normally though. Well, you have to I reread mean, like, a thousand I mean, times. Yeah, <laughs> but I guess also putting it into words that makes sense. So the physical mechanism which drives the reduction in the inertial mass is based on creating a negative pressure gradient, which is which is brought on by polarizing the local vacuum and apparently they say that this is achieved by coupling the accelerated high frequency vibrations with an already already accelerated high frequency ro- axial rotation of a charged system mm-hmm. so this is this is talking about how i guess they're able to achieve the um right the uh, the vacuum polarization, the Vulcan, vacuum polarization. Yeah. yeah so the axial rotating charge system i don't know what that is either like i assume that it has something to do with that resonant cavity on the yeah. ship though i don't know if the cavity is the micro i don't know if the micro um the microwave generators are rotating i don't know if it's mm-hmm. the actual cavities rotating i don't know if the ship's rotating it's very unclear what that means but the yeah. axial rotating part seems to be a key to this they mention it several times without within the patent yeah, I mean, they just say that they couple the accelerated high frequency, the vib- the thing that's providing the the high frequency vibration yeah. with another another thing that's also high frequency, but it's rotating act like in, on its axis. Right, right. So this, this creates the polarization in the vacuum. And, uh, and then they say this has to be close, in close proximity to the object that you want to reduce the inertial mass to. Right. And Which then, can be the resonant cavity itself. So yeah, that makes sure. that's, that makes sense. So it says, in other words, inertial mass reduction can be achieved via manipulation of quantum field fluctuations in the vacuum state, in the mm-hmm. vacuum energy state, in the immediate proximity of the object or system. So it's possible to reduce a craft's inertia and its resistance to motion by polarizing the vacuum in close proximity of a moving craft. And that's where they lost me. <laughs> So the conclusion just comes out of nowhere. It doesn't really convince me because I don't understand. 
I need to understand what the hell negative pressure is. I need to understand what he's talking about with the perturbation. Well, I mean, uh, the way I would understand negative pressure is if you create a gradient in pressure, meaning like your total, your pressure is now, there's a gradient. So, you know, you're going from a high pressure to low pressure situation. Right. But then that's not going to be anything really crazy because we already understand negative pressure gradients, yeah, right? Yeah. Like they do that kind of thing with um, a lot of times with your um, ventilation, yeah, your ventilation systems in your house. Um, but I don't know if that's what it's saying because, I mean... How would that create a how would that create an inertial mass reduction? Doesn't make sense no to clue. me. I mean, that's you that's, can't reduce a mass of a an of object like that to me. No, I'm not seeing it. I just don't I'm see, not seeing it. Either, see but, it. Um, it's very high level though, of course. So I can't just dismiss it off right. Um, but that's the problem with some of these things with high level stuff is like you can't tell if it's bullshit <laughs> or if it's just really high level. But right now, I can just say I don't know. Um, but from this paper, they have not done a good job at all of trying to simplify this mechanism and make it, make it really understandable. No. Um, and in fact, this next paragraph is kind of Are you going to read the next one? to me. It's a I small paragraph. Okay. So all okay. they say is polarization of the local vacuum is analogous to manipulating or modifying the local space-time topological lattice energy density. I tried looking that up and <laughs> I think the only thing that I got back was just the patent itself again. And then it says, as a result, extreme speeds can be achieved. That seems a little nuts to me because... Of course, if you can manipulate inertial mass, if you can reduce the inertial mass, then you can travel at extreme speeds. Well, yeah, you speeds. can move something with relative ease. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get it. But the, but the conclusion doesn't mean that <laughs> what's following it makes any sense. No, I know. I mean, the polar. I I don't see the jump from polarizing the vacuum yeah. to achieving. You can achieve extreme speeds, right? By re, I, I get the reducing inertial mass mm -hmm, mm -hmm. means that you can move objects fast, right? But I don't get how the the polarization stuff exactly. That's the same my, problem I had with this whole patent. I think every yeah. time I tr and I read through the whole thing multiple times. Yeah. Any time I tried to understand what he meant what the transition was from the polar vacuum polarization to actually reducing the mass. I just couldn't, I couldn't piece the two together yeah. no matter how much I researched. Yeah. I tried researching the Casimir effect. I tried researching the quantum vac, uh, quantum vacuum, um, mm -hmm. thrusters. I tried researching the EM drive. I researched a bunch of stuff that should be related to this somehow. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't, couldn't get to an answer that made sense to me. Yeah. Um, so I, I just don't know what to say about it really. And the fact that these patents are public is another mystery to me. Another f mystery is the fact that he has f like four or five revolutionary technology patents and then nothing else, no other patents. That's another mystery to me. So there's just so much mis mystery behind these patents. I just don't know what to think about this. Yeah. Um, Nothing really makes sense. And then other and then his other his other patents are used in this patent to make it work. So one of the things he claims is that he needs to make a high frequency um, EM generator, which is the other patent that he made. So he actually created another patent making the high frequency generator to make this object. See, now, now it's just starting to get fishy to <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, so it's like a snowball effect of unproven concepts yeah. that he's using to make these things. Like, so. uh, you know, when, when people like Alex Jones cite themselves as a source. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I reported this. Right. It's reported in the news, you know. <laughs> but yeah, it's... Uh, That's when it becomes really dubious. Okay, this is definitely a big... Like, like some of the... Okay, like some of the stuff in here is, seems a little bit like, um, I mean, it's based on modern physics, yeah. for sure. But I think it's a little bit jargony. I think the people are probably, either they're purposefully leaving information out or making it ambiguous so that people, it's just so that they can say that we got it, we got here first instead of actually revealing like the full mm -hmm. patent in the sense that like you, you get a full picture of how it works. Um, they're probably just giving like the general, like these are the main concepts you need to get to this point. And then, but there's they know such, all the details to me. It just seems like if they're giving general concepts like that, like to me, that's already a giant claim. Like how can you, 
how mm. can you claim that this is the way to get to these things? It just yeah. seems so I'm not convinced at all. I'm not I mean, convinced either. I mean, it's right now it's unverifiable because yeah. like you're saying, you need to, you need to create. This, and like, these are thing. like ongoing problems with the top, top physicists yeah. in the world yeah. that aren't even close to this. So yeah. this one guy is coming up with four revolutionary ideas with different areas of physics. The top people in there can't, aren't even close to the same page yeah. as him. Like, is he God? <laughs> well, to, to be fair, to be fair, a lot of guys in academia aren't really, don't really care about the applications as much. As they don't, but they come in, up with the physics. That should even be more telling because they're yeah. not even thinking about the application. Mm -hmm. They come up with the physics behind it. So, and they're not even close to, we don't have anything close to a super, a room temperature yeah, super conductor Yeah, but sometimes innovation is the, the mother of it. But this guy then know. is coming up with the physics and the innovation at once. Yeah, yeah. I'm not convinced of that. I'm not at all. convinced either. I'm not convinced. I'm just that playing at all. devil's advocate a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And I'm just counteract counter <laughs> countering your points. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm 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 skeptical. Um, but you know what? This is a very interesting topic. I don't know if we covered everything you wanted to to talk well, about. Well, we got to enough. I mean, um, it's sixty six minutes, so let's go ahead and start wrapping it up. I mean, yeah. What were your? Did you have any thoughts on this one? I mean, what do you think? think uh, I'm, le I'm leaning towards uh, I mean this guy's real this guy's a real person yeah um, I just don't think that I think I think they may have something I think the Navy might have something if if China does indeed or other nations have some kind of technology like this they're putting this patent out there so that they can say that we got to it first but they're not fully revealing the entire picture I think if that's the case, if that's the case at all. So you're thinking it's a strategy to like scare China. It's a strategy to strong arm other nations to be like, we're ahead of you. Like we've already got it figured out. But don't you think other nations would be smart enough with the spies and the hacking that they already do to know where we're at and the understanding of where we're at in physics just globally? Maybe. I don't know. Like I don't, I don't see this patent being enough to scare the nation of China. You know, they no. know a lot more than we probably think that they know. Yeah, oh, 100%. But, uh, I'm sure they have spies. They have people that report yeah. where we're at technologically. I'm sure this is this just doesn't seem like a reasonable scare tactic or scare yeah. effort to me. I just don't see it. Hmm. Maybe. Yeah, this this is just, this has what me you, clueless. You I just, I, yeah. I don't know because the thing is like, it was appealed by the chief technology officer of that naval division it's which is patents. a real person, James Sheehy. Right, Sheehy. And you can, she, yeah. you can see pictures of him online. You can see his resume on LinkedIn. LinkedIn yeah. I looked at all his stuff. He's 100% seems to me 100% credible. Like been working I, there for 11 years. Yeah, and then Salvatore seems like he's legit too. I mean, you can find his actual thesis online. You can find like his you can even find where he was on the website of his advisor that got taken off. Like you, you, there's, there's things out there that make sense, and these guys have actual traceable, um, what do you call it? traceable uh, credentials. Mm -hmm. So I just don't understand what these patents are. Like, what is the reasoning behind this? I don't understand why they're out, mm -hmm. why they were be released public, publicly. Because yeah, some of the patents that got um got uh under secrecy were things like solar panels were put under the secrecy order. Mm -hmm. um, a device for encryption that was that was um, put under secrecy in the 60s only got unsecret within like 2016 or something. And the technology was already way deprecated by that point. Yeah. So like the things that get under secrecy are much, much less than something like this would be. Mm -hmm. So I just don't understand what the point is. I don't know what, mm -hmm. what is going on here. Or maybe there's somebody, there's a good guy in the Navy that's just like, humanity needs this technology i don't know <laughs> but he didn't really say anything no i know <laughs> so i mean yeah so there you have it folks yeah we might have a follow-up actually I, I would like to dive into this a little bit more yeah. and do a real thorough like follow-up and, and see you know what what are what our thoughts are conclusively and maybe me and terrence can dig into the the literature a little bit and, and see what we find for y'all out there see what we can we can muster up Right. Maybe yeah. we can even go over the other patents, too, yeah. in more detail. Yeah, for sure. 
Cool, man. So, so I guess one question for the audience is, um, what do you guys think? Uh, yeah. Do you do you have any resources on Salvatore or any interesting thoughts do you have that might blow this up? Yeah. Um, do you think we could get Salvatore on Joe Rogan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, start a campaign. Yeah, start a campaign. <laughs> Spam the uh, Joe Rogan subreddit. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, guys. Uh, anything each you have that you would like to comment about um, this, this, uh, these weird UFO patents? Yes. Leave them. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Yes, please. And uh, that's yeah. it, guys. Stay tuned for the outro. Hey. Yo. Thank you. Thank you, guys. For, uh, staying this long and making it to the end of the episode, and uh, yeah, towards the end, we're, we're kind of. Uh, I mean, I was just more confused than I was at, <laughs> at the beginning of it. So, yeah, this one was a tough one. I think we're going to have to delve more into it. We're definitely going to have to do a follow up because the topics covered here are a little bit kind of uh, high level, high level, and, and they require a, a, a more in depth analysis and, and maybe cross referencing certain literature and stuff like that. So, right. Look, so, look forward to that if you, you are a fan of this one. And uh, yeah, li like. You know, try to answer the question that we proposed mm -hmm. in the comments section and like and subscribe if you haven't already. Um, share. Share. Sharing is the most mm -hmm. sharing is caring. Really. <laughs> and uh, follow us on all social media accounts, uh -huh. you know, especially if you have a Twitter. Our Twitter is really active. Mm -hmm. It's at um, Eigen Bros. At Eigen Bros. And uh, yeah, so. Yep. Anything else? Check out the website. And then mm -hmm. also, if you guys want to listen to the audio, remember we're on Spotify, mm -hmm. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, yes. tune in, blah, blah, blah. Just check it out. We're everywhere, guys. Yeah. And we'll see you next episode. All right. Thanks. Bye, guys. I don't know what that means to play us out. What does that mean? To end the show? To end the show? To end the show? To end the show? To end the show, to end the show, to end the show, to end the show.